Would you take God's word today and open, please, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and today we're going to look at verses 1 through 11 of 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Would you stand for the reading of God's word this morning, please? We'll read together in verse 1. But I determined this with myself, this is 2 Corinthians 2, 1, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sor- sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad? But the same which is made sorry by me. I wrote this same unto you, lest when I come I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, um, not that you should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. Thank you so much. You may be seated. May God bless our understanding of God's word today. This is his inspired and errant word. May we submit to it. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that you would help us now as we come to this part of the worship to realize how important it is and that we listen with reverence and understanding. Lord, give us understanding. Holy Spirit, open the eyes of our heart that we may see. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As Christians and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are called upon to love others. There's nothing unclear about that. The Bible says, this is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. These are the words of our Lord Jesus in John 15, 12. Thirteen times in the New Testament, we read the expression, love one another. And so the Bible's clear on this. And there are many other times in Scripture we're commanded to love, not just those 13 verses there. For example, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, it says that we do not have to be humanly taught to love because we ourselves, quote, are taught by God to love one another. So therefore, we're told to pursue love. That's 1 Corinthians 4, 1. To put on love. That's Colossians 3, 14. To increase and abound in love. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12. To be sincere in love to be unified in love, to be fervent in love, and so on. Now, having said all that, it's not always an easy command to obey, is it? That we love others. Even with the help of the Holy Spirit, in my own sinfulness, I still struggle at times to love other people the way God has called me to love. Even on my best day, sometimes I struggle to do this, let alone on days when I'm really not having a good day. Um, You ever have one of those days? Or maybe you're in pain or maybe you're suffering and it makes it even more difficult. Or maybe you've been hurt by the very ones that you are called upon to love. It, It becomes a lot more difficult. This is why this message from Paul is so amazing because Paul here, the central message that he's going to give us is that we learn to love one another the way God has called us to. But you have to keep in mind that when Paul writes these words, he himself has been deeply hurt by the very church and the very people that he's telling to love one another. The church at Corinth had caused Paul a lot of pain. You you might remember we talked about this last week. Paul started the church at Corinth. After he left the church, he received disturbing news about the problems that were going on. So he wrote a letter in response to that. That's letter A. That's not 1 Corinthians, um, but the first letter he wrote to them. And then uh, he confronts some of the issues in the letter, but still he continues to hear some of the problems, uh, the trouble that's there in Corinth. And so And in response to the questions they had in a letter they sent to him, he writes 1 Corinthians, and he tries to deal with some of the issues there, and still the problems remain. So Paul finally made a visit to Corinth. He calls this his painful visit. This visit didn't go really well. He had to confront some of the church members about things that were going on, and he left that visit being just a bit disheartened and discouraged over the things that were going on there. He promised that he would go and visit them again, but instead of doing that, he sent what he calls a severe letter. And in that letter, he rebukes again severely the people that are there at the church at Corinth. Later on, he's waiting to hear how things are going. He's so troubled by the situation in Corinth that he, even when there's a door open for him to minister in Troas, he's unable to do it. Finally, he gets word from Titus 
who met him in Macedonia that things were getting better. But this church caused him a lot of pain. And in fact, there was a man in the church that caused Paul a lot of pain. Uh, we're not sure exactly what was said, but he rebuked Paul publicly. He uh, shamed Paul. We don't know his name because it's not given, but look at, we, we're hint, he's hinted at here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look down in verse number 5. It says, but if any have caused grief, the any there, that's the guy. Paul doesn't give his name. Or the he in verse number 5, he hath not grieved me, but in part, Though the any, the he there is referring to him. And then verse number six, sufficient to such a man is this punishment. Such a man is how he refers to in verse number six. So there was problems in the church, and there was one individual man that specifically was giving Paul a lot of trouble, and he publicly insulted the apostle Paul. Now, who could this man be? Let me, let me try to piece some of this together for you. I think you need to get some of the background to really understand what Paul is saying here. Let me tell you who I think it was. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5 and look at verse number 1. In 1 Corinthians 5, there's a situation that arose in the church that Paul had to deal with. In verse 1, it says, it's reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's Wife. There was a situation of sin that rose up in the church, a grievous sin. And Paul deals with this, this report. He said it's reported commonly. The word report here, present indicative of the idea of it's a statement of a fact. It's not a rumor. This is a fact that this is going on. Present indicative is just constantly happening. This is an affair that's going on in the church. And it says commonly in verse number one, reported commonly. That's, we could translate that actually. In other words, it's the idea of shock and surprise. Paul is shocked. He's amazed that this situation would come up in the church. We should always be shocked at sin in the church. Sadly, today, sin is so rampant in churches that it's no more a shock. We've kind of forgotten how to blush and be ashamed. What was going on here is he says that um, that. There is fornication among you. This is a general word for sexual sin, porneo, where we get the word pornography. And it, it's a very general word. It can include all kinds of things, but Paul's very specific in verse 1, that a man should have his father's wife. Now, the wording of the Greek indicates that this is a, man, a, a man's stepmother. His father, it's not his mother. His father married a woman, perhaps a much younger woman, and this man had an affair with his father's wife or was an ongoing affair. And so, the idea of the word have, again, it's present indicative, not a one-time thing. This is an ongoing affair that is going on, and Paul says that something like this is not so much his name <clears throat> among the Gentiles. What did Paul mean by that? Does he mean that even the Gentiles don't do this? Well, no, obviously, not. that's not true. The pagan world and the unsaved do that all the time. But what he's saying here is that, what he meant is that the Roman law doesn't tolerate this. Even Roman law doesn't tolerate this kind of sin. It was a crime that was punishable by Roman law with the severest penalty. There would be no leniency in Roman law for something like this going on. Paul's saying, look, even the government doesn't tolerate this. Why should the church tolerate such behavior when even the government doesn't do it? But notice the reaction of the church. Look at verse 2. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from you. What a wrong response to sin, to be puffed up. What does he mean by that? I don't think that it's doubtful that, that they're being puffed up over the actual sinful act. I think what he's referring to here is that they are boastful and proud over the status of this person that has come to their church. You know, every once in a while, someone with a uh, high social standing, someone famous, someone well-known may come to a church, and if they become a part of that church, that becomes a point of boasting for that church to have someone so high up in uh, social standing, someone so famous, someone of means coming to the church. This is what Paul, I think, means by this. The church of Corinth is very proud to have this person as a part of their church because this is a person of standing, of some means, Maybe a senator, maybe, uh, maybe a gladiator, maybe someone who is well-known, someone that had a lot of money, maybe an aristocrat. They were 
puffed up. They were boastful and proud that this person was a part of their church, so much so that they were willing to overlook this sin rather than mourn over it. And, you know, we face the same temptation all the time in churches to overlook things that are displeasing to the Lord rather than confronting it, rather than dealing with it. Paul said the response should be that you should mourn. And by the way, that's the response of a true believer over sin. In their own life and in the life of others, true believers mourn over sin. We mourn. In fact, Jesus said this, blessed are they that what mourn, for they shall be comforted. What was he talking about? He was talking about believers always mourning over sin and maintaining a spirit of repentance. If you're a child of God, you don't just repent once. You have a continual spirit of repentance. And it means that you do battle against sin in your own life. And when you lose that battle, you mourn over it. You have that spirit of repentance, that spirit of mourning. And when we see sin in another person's life, doing great damage or in the church, bringing shame to the name of Christ, it should equally cause us to mourn over that. So what does Paul tell them? Look at verse 3. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. Paul's not there. Paul says, well, let me tell you what needs to happen. This person needs to be removed, and I'm not even there. I'm not there in in body, but I'm there in spirit, and I've already judged this matter. You know, Jesus gave in Matthew 18 a process of church discipline in a church. But Paul, this sin is so severe, Paul bypasses all of that, and he goes straight to you need to remove this person. This sin is, is so damaging It's so shameful. I'm not there, but I've already judged the situation. You need to cast this person out. Take them from among you. Look down in verse number four, that in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse five, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Paul says, look, next time you come together, you need to take official action. I'm not there, but I'm there in spirit. And what you need to do is you need to cast this person out. You need to deliver them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That is, if they're truly saved, their soul will be go to heaven, but their body will be destroyed. You take them out of the protection of the church body, just get them out. If Satan takes them out, so be it. It's pretty strong. Destruction of the flesh. And Paul's very serious about this. Paul said, I've already judged it. This is what you should do. This shows you how destructive sin can be in the church. He says in verse 6, your glorying is not good. It's not good that you overlook this. It's not good that you, that you do this. And I think that this was all part of Paul's painful visit when he addressed this situation. It still wasn't taken care of in the church. And so when Paul went to see them face to face, he dealt with this issue. And what happened was this very man who was being judged by Paul rebuked Paul or brought some of the people onto his side. And rather than Standing with Paul, the church at Corinth did not defend him. They did not stand with him. They, they chose this person. And to add to that, there were false teachers in the church that were saying, Paul is not a legitimate apostle. He's not real. And they were attacking Paul. They, they just went after Paul's credibility. They did a, a wholesale attack on the character of Paul. And so Paul, in this painful visit, he leaves broken. He leaves hurting. Now, later on, when Paul is, uh, after he writes the severe letter, he's praying for God to turn the situation around. That's why he's waiting in Macedonia. He's waiting for word from Titus. And the good news is, is that Titus comes and he gives him word. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and look down in verse number, we'll start with verse number 5. 2 Corinthians 7, look at verse number 5. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. Paul said, you know, I... I was waiting there. I wanted to know what was going on, what was happening. Our flesh had no rest. But we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings. Within were fears. Verse 6, nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. Man, we were comforted when Titus finally came and he gave us word. And what was the word in verse number 7? 
and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted. And you, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind towards me so that I rejoice the more. You know what happened? The Corinthian church repented and they got right. And the man that was disciplined, he repented and he got right. And so the situation was turning around. And this is what brought Paul comfort. This is what brought Paul this great joy. Look in verse number eight. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. You know, what he's saying is, you know, it was hard to write that severe letter. You ever have, ever have to write a letter to rebuke someone? That's not easy. You know, when you write that letter, you know, sleep on it before you send it. Paul said, I wrote this letter. It wasn't easy. It was a severe letter. Now I'm glad I wrote it. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. I'm not sorry I wrote that letter. For though I did repent, that is, it was hard to write it. It was hard to send it at the time. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were for a season. Verse 9, now I rejoice. Not that you're made sorry, but that you sorrow to repentance. I'm so glad now that I wrote that letter, that I rebuked you the way I should, because that letter made you sorry, and it led to your repentance. And so I'm glad that God used it to work in your heart. And so now, this man has repented as well. And so what's Paul doing here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2? He's telling the church how to respond now. And, and all of this, and all this ordeal here, I think the idea is love, learning how to love even when it's difficult, even when it's painful. And if you go back to chapter 2, the, the key phrase is in chapter 2, verse number 8. Look at that verse with me there. He says this, Wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love towards him. The word confirm there is a technical term used for legal action formally approving something, Paul has in mind that this church do something, some demonstration to show your love to this person who has sinned, and yet now he's repented. Confirm your love to them. Now, again, in this whole letter, what we see here, <clears throat> excuse me, is how to love even in difficult situations even when it's hard, even when it's painful. And Paul himself is an example of this because Paul himself has been hurt. And yet what we see here is an incredible selflessness from Paul where he's, kind of, he's not thinking of himself. He's thinking of the good of others. He's thinking of the good of the church. He's thinking of that individual and those people. <clears throat> so let me just give you three Practical steps. Is that right? I got 10 minutes. That's all introduction. <laughs> not even, I, I'm not even at point one yet. So we'll go through these quickly. But let me just give you three quick ways to, practical ways, to confirm love to others in the church. Here's number one. Just very simply, put others first. That's what Paul does here. Paul doesn't think about his own feelings during this whole ordeal. He only thinks about others. Now, again, remember the Corinthians were mad at Paul because he didn't visit the way he said, but the reason he didn't, look in chapter 2, verse number 1. He tells the reason, I, I plan to visit you, and I changed my mind, partly because of providence, but the other thing was in chapter 2, verse 1, for I determined this with myself that I would not come again to you in heaviness. I did not want another painful confrontation. That would not be good for you. It wouldn't be good for me. The last time he met with them, over this issue, it was, it, was, it was not easy. It was, again, emotionally painful. Rebuking a friend is not easy, but sometimes it's necessary. And Paul did that in the last visit. The Bible says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do is, you can, is to confront someone in love over something biblical that they need to hear. But then after that, Paul used wisdom, and he backed off, and he said, you know what? I didn't want to come. I didn't want to confront you again because that was so hard the last time. Look at verse number 2. For if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad but the same which is made sorry for, by me? In other words, Paul said, you know, it hurt me too. He, he, you know, 
if I make you sorry, what about me? I mean, this, this whole thing was hard on me as well. I wanted, to, I wanted to spare you and spare me. And Paul was giving God time to work there. He was hoping to avoid the sorrow. So instead of visiting them personally, he writes the severe letter instead. That's what he says in verse number three. And I wrote the same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. He wrote the letter hoping that the next time he would meet with them and confront them, it would not be a, a painful visit, it would not be in sorrow, but rather that the letter, the rebuke would do its work, and that then the next time they meet, it would be rejoicing, not sorrow. That's what he was hoping for. And of course, that's exactly how it worked out. But everything that Paul did in this whole situation is not for him, it was for others. He put others ahead of himself. And that's the way love operates. Love does what's best for others. Love puts others ahead. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, love does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil. Love is not selfish. It puts others first. But here's the second thing. You want to show how you love, to love others? Not only put others first, but help others grow spiritually. This is why Paul did all of this. Look at verse 5. But if any have caused grief, he has not grieved me. Paul's whole point is, look, this, this person hasn't just grieved me. I'm not the issue here. The issue is all of you. The issue is the church. He wants the church to grow spiritually. He wants the people to grow spiritually. And sin is destructive to a, the body of Christ. It's destructive to an individual. It hinders the sanctifying work that God wants to do among his people. And Paul said, really, I'm not the issue. It's not me. He hasn't really hurt me, maybe in part, but really what he's done is he's hurt the whole church in this thing. And look what he says again, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Paul said, I don't, wanna, I don't want me to be the issue. I don't want to add a charge against this man by making me the issue. Evidently, there were some in the church that were still mad at this man for the way they treated Paul. And Paul says, look, you know, back off, let it go. I'm not the issue here. The whole issue is the spiritual health and spiritual growth of the church. Look what he says in verse number six. Sufficient to such a man is the punishment which was inflicted of many. Paul said, you know, he suffered enough Evidently, the church obeyed Paul later, and they did discipline this guy. The many in the church came, and they inflicted this punishment, this discipline on the man, and all of that has brought enough pain to him. And Paul said, you know what? He suffered enough. It's time now to let this go. Don't make me the issue. You see, Paul wanted them to understand that the issue is sin. Sin is what's destructive. That's why we have to deal thoroughly with it. That's why if you go back to 1 Corinthians 5, when Paul was talking about this sin, he uses the illustration of leaven in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you might be a new lump. In verse 6, if you back up, he says, Know ye not that a little leaven, leaven's a whole lump. Little is the word for mikros, really small. You put just a little bit of leaven into a big lump, you know what's going to happen? It's going to permeate throughout the whole lump. And leaven here is a symbol of sin, and that's what sin does. Don't you get the idea that the sin that you commit only affects you. It affects everyone around you. If it's in the body of Christ where members one of another, your sin affects the whole church. You can't just live unto yourself and die unto yourself if you're a believer and you're part of the church of Jesus Christ. There's no such thing as a lone ranger existence. The Bible, when it uses the word saints, it's always plural. It's never singular. We're always together. We're members one of another. We're to be accountable one to another. And one person's sin doesn't just affect that person. It has a permeating effect to everyone. And that's why we need to be accountable to one another. That's why we need to encourage one another in meekness and humility and love because we need the encouragement and the help from one another. We need to purge out the old leaven, Paul said. That's the point that he's making. Paul said, you know, the, the issue is not me. The issue is sin and the destructive nature of sin. But here's, the, here's the, the third thing that I would give you. If you want to show love, put others first, help others grow spiritually, 
Sometimes discipline and being accountable to one another helps in the spiritual growth in the battle. But then number three is forgive others. Just simply forgive. Paul was saying, look, it's time to forgive now. Look what he says in verse number seven. So that contrary wise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. What was he saying? It's time now to affirm this person has demonstrated true repentance in their life. And when a person truly repents, what's the response of the church supposed to be? You embrace him. You love him. You comfort him. And that's not just a one-time thing. You continually embrace him. You continually comfort them. You continue to confirm your love. I remember uh, in the first church that I pastored many years ago, we had a man who was on staff in the church that committed a terrible sin, a public sin. It was such a shameful, scandalous sin that this, this sin made the front page of the news. It was on TV, not just local TV, but statewide. This, this person's sin was grievous. And yet, when I confronted this person, they broke and they mourned, and they repented. And then th- th- this man stood before the church with tears and brokenness and confessed his sin and repented and said, I'm sorry. And the repentance was obviously genuine. But yet there were some in the church that were so embarrassed by what this person done, they no longer wanted him to be a part of the church. They said, get him out, cast him out, you know. And I reminded the church that, look, the world is not... Ch- shocked when a Christian falls. What surprises the world is how the church responds to it. Someone said the church is the only army that shoots its own wounded. And so I reminded the church, listen, what would be an embarrassment to the name of the Lord is to throw this person out after they've repented. Is that what we're supposed to do? What did Paul say to the church of Corinth. Now, I think there were some people in the church of Corinth that were still angry at this man for his sin and the way he treated Paul. But what does Paul say to them? Look, it's time to forgive now. It's time to comfort him. And the last thing you wanted to do this to do is for this man to be so filled with guilt and remorse and shame over what he had done that he ends up quitting and walking away from the faith. That's what he means in verse number nine when he says, um, he says that, uh, that, Know the proof of him, whether you be obedient. I'm sorry, verse number seven, where it says that one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. The idea they're being swallowed up is just, they would absolutely just totally be devastated by the shame of what they've done and actually quit. So what's the response? You confirm your love. You go to him. You, you, You do something tangible to demonstrate that this person is forgiven and they're loved and they're part of the body of Christ, and they're valuable. That's, that's the way you respond. You know why? Because there's none of us in here that is too high and mighty that we can't fall at any moment. We're all sinners battling against sin. We need the help and the strength and the encouragement of others. And when another person fails and then they genuinely repent, the church should be there to be the first ones to pick them up and embrace them and love them, dust them off, and encourage them to move forward for God. But So Paul's encouraging the church to do that very thing. Again, he says in verse 8, Wherefore, I beseech you, I beg you, that ye would confirm your love towards him. Verse 9, For to this end did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you would be obedient. Paul said, I wrote, I told you to do this to see whether or not you would be obedient to what I said, and you were. Now finish it. Now that he's repented, now you need to forgive him. Verse 10, to whom ye forgave anything, I forgave also. For if I forgive anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgive I it in the person of Christ. Look, I've already forgiven this person. If you haven't forgiven him because of me, please don't, because I've already, everything he's ever did against me, it's gone. I've forgiven him. And he gives two reasons why we should forgive. Number one, because it pleases Christ. And verse number 10, I did it in the person of Christ, literally the Greek prosopon, in the face of Christ, in the presence of Christ. If Jesus were here, would you continue to harbor that unforgiveness or would you forgive him? I did it in the presence of Christ before the face of Christ. I forgave him. You know why? Because 
Christ loves it when we have a forgiving spirit. But when we harbor unforgiveness and bitterness, it, it robs us of blessings. It hurts you if you don't forgive. But then here's the second reason he gives, because it disappoints the devil when you forgive. Look at verse 10, 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. Satan would love for you to harbor unforgiveness. He would love for you to hold this in your heart. That would give him an advantage. Boy, he loves having an advantage. He can work in the heart of an unforgiving person. He can work in the heart of a person who has bitterness. You say, well, they don't deserve to be forgiven. I know that's why it's called forgiveness. I didn't deserve to be forgiven by God. You didn't deserve to be forgiven. But our master taught us to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We don't want to give Satan an advantage. We want to forgive. And so Paul says, I beg you, confirm your love. Let him know that he's loved. Let him know that he's forgiven. And continually confirm that love. You see someone coming to this church that hasn't been here in a long time, you know what your response should be? It should not be to give them a cold shoulder and say, well, you know. Thank God they finally got right with God. <laughs> That's not the response. You know what your response should be? Man, I've really missed you, and I love you. I'm so glad you're here. We don't know what that person's gone through. We don't know the health issues they've had to battle with. We don't know the grief that they've had to deal with. We don't know whether they've been gone because of some legitimate reason or some of the things that they've been wrestling with in their heart. All I know is this, when they walk through the door, they should have, we should have the, the spirit of the, the father waiting for the prodigal son with open arms. Amen. Amen. We're so glad you're here. They, they should see a haven of love and acceptance and rejoicing and continual confirmation of love. Because you know what? We need that. We need each other. We all need that confirmation, that loving spirit. And so may this be our heart. I challenge all of us to, to have this kind of spirit and love towards one another as believers in Christ. Let's, let's pray. We're out of time today. Father, we thank you again for how your word is so practical, so helpful to us. Lord, you've commanded us to love. There's no question about that. And you've given us the Holy Spirit who has shed the love of God abroad in our heart. And so this is something that comes to us as children of God. And yet, even in all of that, Lord, in our, our selfishness and in our sinfulness and in our pride, sometimes we still struggle with this. We struggle because of our own sin. God, help us. Forgive us. Lord, we humbly come before you and ask for forgiveness for our own pride. And Lord, for our own unforgiving spirit. And if there's someone that we have locked in the prison of our heart and have refused to release them from that prison, I pray that today, Lord, we would release them. We would forgive them that we would harbor no ill will towards another brother, towards those, Lord, that may have struggled. But what they see in us, Lord, is a full loving heart, a heart that understands how much we have been forgiven by you. Humble us. Lord, make our church a haven of love for the hurting, for the dying that they may see and sense the Spirit of Christ in every one of the believers here. And Lord, I pray for the soul that's here today that's struggling. They're struggling under the weight of sin. They have not yet not been to the cross for forgiveness, for salvation. They still carry the burden of sin. Lord, I pray that they would kneel at the cross today and the burden of sin would fall away. That they would put their full faith and hope and trust in the finished work of Christ and Christ alone. 
get full forgiveness and pardon and eternal life through Christ. Lord, do your work and bring salvation with heads bowed and eyes closed. It may be that that's your condition. You're here today. You've never yet put your full faith in Christ and trusted Christ and Christ alone for salvation. I'm begging you today that you go to the cross right there in your mind by faith. Go to Christ. Run to him and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Save me. Cleanse me. I trust in you and you alone for my salvation. I repent. I turn to you with all my heart. Save me. Friend, don't let that opportunity go away. Make sure of your soul. Trust him. And if you've done that, if you made that decision, let us know. We want to rejoice with you. We want to encourage you in your Christian walk today. Father, bless the words that people have heard today. Lord, seal it with your work of the Spirit in every heart, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.